So yeah, we will get going. Uh, I'm really excited about this workshop today. It's all about using video to progress your climbing. Uh, video analysis is one of my favorite topics to coach on as well as to teach about. So I'm really excited uh, for this today and thank you all for coming. Oh, before we get started, I'll just go over what we're gonna be talking about today. So first we're going to talk about the different approaches to skill acquisition. We're gonna talk about different types of feedback. The bulk of the presentation is gonna be around analyzing video, and then we'll talk about the drawbacks of over-analysis. I do want this uh, presentation to be pretty interactive, and I'll definitely be asking you all to chime into the chat from time to time. But if you do have any questions, I'll just ask that you save those for the end, and we'll have a Q&A uh, session at the end of the presentation. So before we dive in, I just want to talk about uh, who I am. My name is Juliette. I am a climbing coach and I work with climbers of all different levels. I pride myself in using a holistic approach where we're looking at strength, technique, and mindset to help you become a better climber. My bachelor's degree is in biology. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist as well as a certified precision nutrition coach. Some of my climbing accomplishments, I've been climbing since 2005, so for 19 years. I started as a youth competitor in the USA Climbing um, Youth Series and then did a few competitions in my adulthood. Some notable results are second place at the 2014 Collegiate Climbing Nationals, as well as 11th place in the 2017 Open Sport Climbing Nationals. Uh, but primarily, I focus on climbing outside now. I've bouldered multiple V12s and I've actually hit my 50th double digit boulder a couple months ago. So that was a, an exciting accomplishment. So we're going to start with the approaches to skill acquisition, which is just a fancy term for how do we become better climbers? How do we become more skilled climbers? And right now there's two main schools of thought. The first is information processing. It's historically what climbing coaches have used. Um, and this is what I would call a top down approach. This is saying that your brain learns something and then it tells your body to do it. The more that the brain knows, the more the body can do. Um, in in a, a, an example, let's say you're trying to teach someone good footwork with the information processing um, method, you would say, okay, you need to use the inside edge of your foot, you need to put pressure through your big toe, you need to lift your heel a little bit. Um, and so giving them the information, and then they're then taking that information and telling their body to do that. Versus the other school of thought um, that kind of opposes this is what's called a constraints-led approach or an ecological dynamics theory. And this is more of a bottom-up approach. So this is saying that you're an organism, is the terms that they use, you're an organism in an environment and you're interacting with your environment and your body is learning as it's interacting with its environment and then your body or then your brain knows. So it's a bottom-up approach. It's saying that the body is learning in its environment and the knowledge kind of follows from that. So this is just a, a, a diagram of a constraints-led approach, and we won't be going too in-depth with this, but this is just um, their depiction of what's going on in a goal-directed activity. So you're given um, an activity with an end goal. Uh, there's gonna be interaction between the organism, the environment and the task at hand. And what I really wanna focus on today is this perception action cycle. And what this is saying is as you're interacting with your environment, you're perceiving more, that perception is gonna to lead to action, that action is gonna give you more information that you're then perceiving. And it continues in a cycle until you select some sort of pattern to, to act on. So when we're talking about types of feedback, that's what we're really talking about. Um, so there's two types. There's internal feedback, which is your sensory perception. So this is what you can see, what you can feel, um, everything that uh, your, your five senses can, um, can gain information from. And the other type of feedback is external feedback, and that's where you're receiving external information and you're trying to then use that information to act. So video is a type of external feedback, right? We're getting information from this external source and then we're trying to internalize it. And some advantages of video as external feedback is that it's a different and objective perspective, right? Uh, what we're perceiving is going to be 
different from what someone else perceives. If we both are looking at the same exact hold, one person might say, oh, this hold is a jug. It's huge. It's really good. And another person might look at the same hold and be like, what are you talking about? That hold is terrible. And so you can kind of compare and contrast the the perception that you have versus the video and, and ask yourself, is what I'm perceiving an accurate accurate perception of reality. So you're on the wall, let's say, and you look up at the next hold you're going to and you're like, whoa, this move is huge. This is way too far away. There's no way I can do it. You get back down, you look at your video and you see yourself on the wall and you're like, oh, that's actually not that far. I just like was perceiving it as being this really huge move. So you can gain some really good objective information from the video. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow for assessment and adjustment. So it's allowing you to continue in this cycle giving you more information to act on, and um, then you can gain more information. All right, now we're heading into the bulk of the presentation, which is video analysis. And this method that I'm going to be talking about today, you have uh, may have seen uh, me talking about on Instagram, but we're just asking, we're just asking questions is, is really what we're doing here. And so I'm going to walk you through an example, and then um, some of you submitted your own videos. And so we're going to workshop through a few uh, examples. So first, uh, the guideline for analysis is just take a look at what is physically happening in the moment. We don't have to get super complicated right off the bat. Just say like, okay, like what's actually happening here? Um, so if you want to type into the chat, other than me falling, <laughs> can you give me some observations about what's physically happening in the moment? We don't need to know why it's happening. We don't need to know, you know, any of the technical things. It's just what can you see happening? So I'll wait a second for you all to chime in. I'm moving dynamically, yep. Thank you, Joy. So definitely moving pretty quickly through this. Anyone else? Barn door off to the right, yep, you can see that my body is kind of opening up. I'm I'm twirling around. Body is coming away off the wall a lot for sure. Yeah. So what we can see, um, in this is is yeah everything you all listed. I'm moving really fast. And um, I'm not able to kind of control that momentum. If we're looking at my fall path, we can see I'm falling down and to the right here and my body's opening up in a barn door effect. So the next question we want to ask is what's the movement crux? What is the underlying issue here? Why am I, exp why am I experiencing this fall this way? Why am I not able to complete the move? And yeah, feel free to chime into the chat again what you think the problem is. The one thing about Zoom is there's always a lag time between <laughs> when I ask the question and when the chats come through. Okay, no opposition with my right foot. Pressure, foot pressure came out. Yeah, so I'm I'm having trouble creating tension. Um, yeah, I have um, my foot coming off. And so what I would say is at the heart of this issue is that. Um, I'm I'm trying to move from left to right, right? That that's that's at the heart of it is I'm moving left to right and I can't control the momentum from left to right. And so what we want to ask here is are there possible alternate solutions to the problem? Is there other beta that I could explore? And so when you get to this, this crossroads here, if you do think there's other beta to try, then keep exploring, try different beta, try crazy things, get creative. If you don't think there's any other option, um, then start refining that current beta, start making small tweaks to it. Uh, in this case, I don't think the method that I'm using is the way, and so I'm going to start exploring different things. In this video, you can see my right hand is low down on this sloper, and I'm trying to do this kind of paddle method where, you know, I release this left foot, and as soon as I'm coming off, I'm trying to paddle through. And like you all said, I'm just moving too dynamically. My foot is coming off. I'm coming away from the wall. 
So what I try on my next try is to move my hand up higher onto uh, what I think is going to be a better part of the hold. It turned out not to be so great. And then I'm using the inside lip uh, there with my left hand uh, to try and create some, some opposition. But what we can see ends up happening is as soon as I let go of that left foot, I'm forced to do a similar kind of quick paddle. Um, I'm still not able to control that momentum. So we asked that same question, is there another solution that I could try? In this case, I'm still not happy with that beta, so I'm going to keep exploring. But if I did decide that that was the only way, that's when I would start refining. All right, so the next thing I'm trying is now I'm getting my left hand to the top of the hold and kind of bringing my right hand to the inside lip. And what we can see is the effect of the fall is, is much less, right? So um, things slow down a little bit. I'm not coming off so far to the right. I'm falling, you know, more straight down, still getting a bit of a barn door effect, but definitely um, things have slowed down quite a bit. And so in this case, I want to I want to keep trying this current method. So I'm going to stop trying different things. And I'm going to chart start trying to refine this beta. And so asking myself, um, once you do decide on a on a method, um, if you're trying it and you're falling, ask yourself, are there further refinements I need to make? Do I need to keep tweaking this movement or am I really happy with where things are at. I just need to focus on the execution. Or if you do uh, go down the path of exploring uh, or trying one beta and you try it and you try it and you try it and you're not seeing any progress, you possibly might want to move back to that exploration phase. It, it might end up that the solution you thought it was going to be um, isn't. And so you go back to exploring different beta. And again, in this case, um, I'm, I'm happy with this beta for now. And so I'm just going to refine it. And so on the next try, I tried the same method, and this time I'm able to stick it. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, so that's just walking through that method for analyzing the video. Um, and just to clarify on these, you know, what I was doing was um, trying a climb, looking at the video, deciding on the tweaks I need to make, trying again, looking at the video kind of back and forth like that. So next we're gonna go through your submissions. Uh, and before we dive into that, I do just want to mention that I'm enrolling for one-on-one -on -one coaching right now. This is my highest support coaching program where we're gonna help you build confidence in your body, movement and mindset to tackle your climbing goals. We're gonna take that comprehensive look at your climbing so that we can efficiently um, create a plan for you to break through your plateau. And I just wanted to share a few words from former clients. Uh, so this client says, I feel more confident in trusting my body. I feel stronger. Some of my biggest takeaways included learning how to open my hips, getting long, trusting high feet, building lower body strength, understanding what I'm capable of and how to challenge myself. Another client says, I also think coaching has helped me be able to approach problems from a place of curiosity. As a result, I'm able to get more intentional practice and improve my skills on slab, face climbing, slopers, et cetera, which translates to more intuitive all around climbing on a greater variety of climbs. And then this last client says, I feel like I have more confidence and focus during my sessions. I feel like my movement is becoming more intuitive and I now have tools in my toolbox to utilize during my sessions. I feel like my goals are quite attainable now. I sent my first V6 outside and it felt easy. And a really nice feature of the one-on-one -on -one coaching is the in-depth video analysis. Again, it's one of my favorite things to coach. And um, in this program, you're gonna be able to get my eyes directly on your climbing. And at the end of each client's program, I like to ask them what their favorite part of the service was. And by and large, the video feedback is um, what a lot of people find the most helpful from the program. So at the end of the presentation, I'll be sending out an email with the replay, and I'll also include a link um, for more information on the one-on-one -on -one coaching. When you apply for the coaching, you can book a free 30-minute discovery call where we're going to talk about what's going on with your climbing and see if the program is a good fit. So thank you for listening through that. And now we're going to dive right back into your climbing submissions. Uh, so thank you all to those who sent in video. We're going to start with Aria here. 
And with the video submissions, I just asked a couple of questions to get some more information about what's going on. So when asked about what um, you're having trouble with in this move, Aria says, I can't get enough airtime to latch the small crimp precisely and keeping my right foot is difficult. And then I asked if um, they tried any other beta and they said, yes, try to hire left foot, try to wider right foot. And then they also played with um, different hip trajectory, um, seeing if just in and right is what uh, they found to be the most helpful. So we're gonna go through the same process. I've slowed the video down to 0.25 speed and we're asking what's physically happening in the moment. So go ahead, chime in into the chat. I know this one is maybe not the, uh, you know, subtlest, um, but go ahead and chime in. What is happening as Arya is trying this move? Hips are coming away as she's trying to latch the hold, falling away from the wall. Right foot is popping off before they get the crimp. Yeah, totally. So what's happening in the moment right now is that that right foot is popping off first. That is the first thing that's coming off um, as she goes to the hold. And then we're going to ask what's the underlying issue? What's the movement crux? And some of you already um, kind of mentioned it, which is if we look at the screen grabs um, from the video, it is the hips that are coming off. So um, there is a moment in time where she makes contact with the hold, the hips are nice and close into the wall, but then they start to fall away. And because the hips are falling away, the, the right foot pops off. So the underlying movement crux is um, that the hips come out. And yeah, Jackie mentioned that she's very extended as well. So I want you all to, to think of some possible solutions. What else could Aria try or what could uh, she refine about the current movement? And just remember that this is um, what she said she tried, the higher left foot, uh, wider right foot, and then was playing with the, the hip trajectories. But yeah, if you have any ideas, feel free to share some potential different solutions for this move. Um, hey, sorry, I joined late. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, if you can. Um, can you actually just type into the chat and um, yeah, with your answer? Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, Joy says, not sure if possible, but perhaps getting a power spot. Yeah, yeah, sometimes getting a power spot can, um, yeah, in engage us. Oh, hi, Arya. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Try getting a power spot. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't realize that was you talking. Um, if you want to unmute, um, you're welcome to. Yeah, uh, so I am aware of all the problems you guys mentioned, and I am I was uh trying to fix them. It's just like it is a very extended um position, even so when I get power spot in, I can like hold it, but it's like um, my right foot is so high, so it's kind of like squeezing my knee kind of hard. Um, if you know what I mean, like my right foot is almost like at my crutch. Mm -hmm. So I, I will just point with different trajectory to let my hip like stay closer to the wall. But I think one way or the other, like it's going to like fall out a bit. Some move is just kind of like that. But like some trajectory gave me a little bit like longer air time. Yeah. Um. So in that case, I don't know whether like a different foot position is going to help. Mm -hmm. Um. So in terms of holding the end position, I think this like two feet are like the best. Yeah. Uh, have tried. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jackie says uh, potentially weighting the right foot and flagging the left. Was that? Uh, was that something you tried, Aria? Um, I don't think I have tried flagging the uh, left foot. Um, it, it just like it's hard to generate from the right foot as well because mm -hmm. it's like so high. Right. Um. So it's like, I need to kind of rock onto it first. And mm -hmm. then the right hand I'm going from is like really bad as like quarter pad. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's like really hard to even get up there um, to use the right foot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, really great feedback from everyone. Thank you for, for giving us more information, Aria. Um, I'm just going to read through the other messages. Um, so Dan says, arc hips out and back and towards the wall, um, which sounds like um, what Aria had tried previously um, in and to the right. Um, Jackie says the uh, the reasoning for the, the flag was so that um, less weight is on the left foot. Joy says, yeah, getting into that ending position. Um, and Arya says that those seem like the best feet from the end position. So here's just from, from what I saw from the video, here's what my suggestion would be. So um, similar to what Jackie was saying is we, we could see the left foot is staying on even though the right foot is coming off. And so that to me says there's more weight going through the left foot than the right foot. And so you're really keeping tension through the left foot where if we were to get more weight onto the right foot, um, the the hip trajectory could continue to the right and keep those hips in for longer. So what I would try, um, and yeah, you can let me know if this isn't possible, but what I would try is to try and come off of the left foot onto the right foot, really um, thinking about getting as much weight as you can onto the right foot so that, yeah, your hips are higher, you get more of that, that hang time to grab the hold, and then potentially the ending position might be a little bit more um, beneficial because you're less extended. Mm hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I, can I have one ask one follow up question? Sure. So uh, in terms of like hips back out and in to use that momentum, do you guys usually would try like, um, you know, going in and right or directly kind of a diagonal line? And do you find like differences in terms of like airtime or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say you could play with either of them. Um, just based on what the video is looking like, it looks like your your hip trajectory looks good. Um, it looks like you're you're you know getting the distance you need to the hold. It's just that mm -hmm. that left leg is um, seems like it's kind of holding you back. So I would say yes. like what you're doing looks good, and I think the in and to the right um, makes sense. I see. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. Thanks for submitting a video and sharing with us all. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. So next we have Jackie. Um, so for this move, she says she's having difficulty with keeping tension with the feet. The foot keeps popping. Um, and then with the other beta, definitely with board climbs, there's many fewer options. Um, and so she said she couldn't reach the other feet. And so this was the shorty beta she was able to find. Um, and so since this one is um, a little more obvious, um, I just went ahead and, and said, for what's physically happening in the moment, the left foot is popping off is what we can see. And then we can also see, um, just to get some more information, is that as she's falling, the swing is straight out. And so feel free to chime in now. Um, what do you all think is the underlying issue? I know um, Jackie kind of mentioned tension in her, her comments when she submitted. Is there anything else you all see? Also, Jackie, if you want to mention what tilter board problem this is, Maybe some of us can go try, <laughs> go try and see it. It looks hard though. All right, seems like we might be a little stumped here. So let's go ahead and look at the screenshots. So first things first, what we can see is happening is as Jackie releases that toe hook, her body is naturally sagging out to keep that tension with her left foot. And then as she goes to generate uh, for the next move, she's bringing her right hip in. And as she brings her right hip in, that foot is popping. So if we just look um, at that moment where the, the hip is popping, it, or sorry, the toe is popping, hopefully the hip's not popping, um, it's when she's bringing her, her right hip into the wall. And so what, from what I can see is happening here, it seems like the, uh, the body is naturally, like I said, sagging away to keep that tension. And so as soon as the hips are coming in, um, you know, that changes and, and the foot is losing tension. 
All right, any ideas for what Jackie could do instead? And she says, sheep v10. Um, she says, I'm too pulled up, so I can't wait the feet. Yeah, we can kind of see that with um, the, the that last picture there is like as she's pulling up, it's much harder to weight the feet. Definitely in an extended position. <laughs> uh, maybe keep the right toe hook and then jump. What, uh, Jackie, what degree did you have the wall on? It looks steep, 60, oh my gosh, that's so steep. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely sounds sounds hard to keep the tension there. Um, yeah, so the alternate solution that I thought of, and uh, again, you can tell me if this is something you tried, Jackie, um, but maybe instead of making this a two-piece motion of releasing the toe hook and then jumping, just trying to jump straight out of the bicycle because right now your foot is trying to serve two different purposes. Um, when you take the toe hook out, it's trying to hold tension and then it's trying to and you're almost, you know, kind of like pulling in with the toe. But then as you go to jump, um, you're kind of switching to trying to push on it. And it's just hard to do both at the same time. And so if you keep the right toe hook in, the toe hook can serve the purpose of keeping the tension. And then the right or the left foot can then do more of the pushing. I know that it's a really extended position. So again, it I'm not 100% sure that this would work, but one potential advantage would be that um, because you're holding so much tension, there's going to be a lot of momentum released when you do release the tension. And, and as long as you feel like you can kind of direct that momentum, it might be um, a plausible option. Oh, yay. Okay, Jackie said she ended up sending it with the bicycle. Okay, yay. I feel like I just like got an answer right on the quiz. <laughs> Sweet. Well, good job. Glad it worked. Very cool. Congrats. All right. All right. And then our last video is Wendy. Um, she is having difficult with this move. The heel keeps popping uh, because it doesn't feel like I can lock it. Right hand is very bad. And then she said she's tried some other beta, but she knows that this beta works for people her height. So this is the beta she wants to stick with. So we'll do the same questions, what's physically happening in the moment. Again, this one's a little more obvious, so I went ahead and just answered it. Of course, what's happening is that the left heel is popping. And now we want to ask, what is the underlying issue? What's the movement crux here? Yeah, this one is uh, in Red Rocks, uh, Spitting Venom. So yeah, uh, chime in with what you think is the issue. Why is the heel popping? What is this underlying crux? Seems like she's not really pulling with the heel, knee angle, says Joy. Yeah, the, the knee make, angle is making it hard to keep the hips in, hip position. Yeah, so if we take a look at the snapshots again, this is uh, when the left hand is leaving. Um, the the hold initially this is as it's making its way through and then as um she's almost to the holder at the hold and yeah what we can see is that knee is really opening up that left hip is really opening up and um that's when when the hip is popping so the left hip is opening up and also just kind of opening up to the left it's really kind of rotating open that we can see as soon as that that left hand um, leaves. Okay, so what cues or advice would you give to Wendy? Uh, what refinements do you think she can make to try and make that heel stay a little bit better? Any ideas? All 
right? Maybe we're not so sure. So uh, what I said was kind of the same strategy Joy mentioned earlier, pulling onto that ending position. And what I would focus on here is what's going on with the right hip. Um, because what we can see is uh, with the foothold placement, the foot is pretty straight on into the wall. And then as she's rotating off, it's kind of turning in. So it seems like that's part of what's happening as the, um, or what's causing that that left hip opening is that we're not getting good opposition with the, with the right foot there. And so what I would say is to try opening up that right hip a bit more in order to create that opposition. It's gonna help um, her pull up and into the wall a little bit more. And then really, yeah, what we can see is the left hand is just doing so much to create that opposition. So if we can create a better position for that heel hook to stay, then um, she'll have a better chance of sticking that move. Thanks for all the participation. That was fun. Uh, hopefully that was helpful to go through a few examples um, so you all can take that and um, analyze your own videos. So lastly, we're just gonna talk about the drawbacks of over-analysis. There is a, a way we can take this too far, of course, as with anything. Um, so video is a tool, but it's not something we necessarily want to over-rely on um, because it's, you know, for one, not a tool that will necessarily always have accessible. Um, let's say it's super crowded at the gym and you're just not able um, to, to get a good uh, setup for your camera, or if you're out at the crag and, your iPhone runs out of storage, which has happened to me a bunch, <laughs> or uh, your phone dies and you're not able to get the video, right? So we want we want to use this as a tool, but ultimately we want to make ourselves better climbers and more intuitive climbers um, at the end of the day. So first drawback is it's not always obvious what's going on in a video. And to demonstrate this, I took screenshots from my two videos. On the left here is when I didn't stick the move. And then on the right is when I did stick the move. And if I was trying to help myself, uh, let's say, stick this move more consistently, I would have a hard time telling myself, okay, like what, what is so different about these two images? What, um, what do I need to change in order to make it more consistent? Um, and we can see that kind of through the few video or the th few screenshots, except for this end one, I'm like a little bit higher up, but again, it's it's hard to exactly see what I should tell myself. And then, of course, we need to effectively be able to uh, apply that external feedback. So it's one thing to know what to do. It's another to be able to execute it on the wall. Um, we're not robots. I'm sure in the future, there's going to be some AI technology that you'll be able to put a climbing video in and it's going to spit back out all the exact angles and all the exact forces you need um, to successfully do the move. But we, our bodies just don't work that way. We, we can't, um, uh, take that and, and be able to apply it effectively. So we have to figure out ways to take that information and um, put it back on the wall. So um, what really comes with the external feedback is being able to cue ourselves. And this is a skill that, that we can continuously learn. So um, with cueing, it's just what you're telling yourself in your head when you're on the wall. It's, okay, I'm going to focus on this or do this. So let's say there was an obvious difference between my two videos. Let's say that my left hip was really turned into the wall and that my right foot stayed on for, for much longer. If you were my coach, uh, what would you what would you tell me to do uh, when I was up on the wall? What would you tell me to focus on? How would you cue me? Go ahead and type into the chat. Coach me, coach me. See. Um, so Joyce says, I would choose one cue at a time and then focus on that one thing first. Yeah, definitely really good advice. Sometimes when we're doing these really coordinated moves, it can be super noisy in our heads. Like, okay, I need to do this with my foot and this with my hand. And um, yeah, that's, that's definitely like one of the um, problems that come with applying that external feedback. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say focus on one thing at a time, see how it works. If it goes great, if that's the one thing you need to think about to stick the move consistently or do the move, that's great. And if it doesn't work, try a different one. Any specific cues anyone has for me?
So for this move, if I were to um, try and implement this, um, what I would say, oh, did I miss a, go slow while transferring your weight over to the right and keep your body close to the wall. Yeah, so just trying to move a little bit more slowly. What I would tell myself in this case is as I was getting set up in this initial position before I moved, I would tell myself, okay, get as extended as I can through this left leg, try and point, you know, come up on my toe as much as I possibly can, um, get as far over to the right as I can before I move. Um, and so, yeah, the cue I would say is just get long through that, that left leg. And then if I wanted to really focus on that right foot, what I would just tell myself is drive hard through the right foot. Just think about pressing really hard through that right foot. And again, if these cues worked or not, just um, trying different things and, and seeing how they work. So that's the main takeaway. Use the video for information and then just practice applying it. It's it's a skill. At the end of the day, uh, video is only a tool. It's not the end all be, all be all. And the importance of perception at the end is what's going to help you become a, a more skilled climber is, is really improving this part of things. So again, I just want to leave you with this image of how perception leads to action, which leads to more perception. So thank you all for coming and for your participation. And I'll open it up for any questions you all have. Hi, everybody. <laughs> any questions, any questions? Oh, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just from, you know, um, like, a, so I'm a, I'm a coach. I'm asking sort of like a coaching question just for mm -hmm. context for anybody else. Um, because I know something that I've really struggled with in the past is giving too many cues, mm -hmm. like, because you try to walk this fine line between you, you see all these things. So you want to help as much as you can, but then it becomes overwhelming. And I guess I'm wondering how, what do you find, um, is a good amount of maybe struggle to let somebody mm -hmm. have. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that could apply to like, even if you're like watching one of your friends, like you don't have to be a climbing coach, but like, you know, how, how, how do you decide? Like, yeah. okay, we're going to let them stop struggling now because there is a lot of value with them self-learning and self-organizing. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great question. And um, yeah, I would say that I tend to lean more towards the like letting them struggle more. Um, and that just comes from that initial, um, those two approaches of the skill acquisition. Uh, one, it's like, yes, someone could fall. You can tell them the beta right off the bat. They have the information. They can go do it. And they, you know, send the climber, do the move, but ultimately it's not like what's going to make them a better climber. And then, like you said, letting them struggle, letting them self-organize, letting them kind of figure it out from themselves, it's ultimately going to be a better learning experience. Um, and so uh, it's, it's hard because at a certain point, they'll probably hit a wall of some sort and, and stop making progress. Um, and in that case, what I like to do is kind of ask leading questions and kind of like help them arrive to it themselves of, uh, okay, like what, what do you think is going on here? Or, um, if I know the answer, how can I lead them there? Um, so that's kind of like the second tier, like first, let them struggle. Second, ask them a bunch of questions. And then third, um, yeah, let, like you said, just giving them the, the one cue at a time and, and seeing how they do with it. And then if it's not working, asking them why they think it's not working or like what, what is actually happening? Oh, when I think about my foot, I forget what my hands are doing, that kind of thing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, maybe frustrating for some people and might not be the best fit for some people. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to let you kind of, that's really cool to think about it in tears though of like, yeah. Instead of, you know, all or nothing thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause I, I really think the thing that um, stops people from, from trying or, or hitting a wall is it's almost more mental of like, just getting really frustrated. Like, Oh, I'm frustrated. I don't want to try this anymore. And say so, like us as coaches trying to help them before they get to that line. But um, 
also helping them build more tolerance for that failure yeah. and frustration. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, Jackie asks, how do you decide if a beta isn't worth pursuing? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, and there's not a great answer for it um, because I'm sure we've all had the experience where we try a beta um, or like our, our, we try a beta first and then we decide, oh, that's not it. Go try another method for forever, 30 minutes, an hour. And then we end up going back to our first method and it ends up working. So so it's really hard to... to um, figure out, okay, why did I go down that wormhole of for 30 to minutes to an hour? Um, and that ended up being the wrong choice, wrong choice. Um, but I would say if you really do just hit a point where um, you can't refine the beta any further, and you do feel like you are trying 100%, um, you feel like you're executing it the best you can, um, and it's still not working, then I would say uh, to, to try a different beta. But definitely that key of, am I giving this 100%? Am I trying as hard as I can with this current method? Okay, it's not working. Let me try something else. Uh, because some sometimes that is another drawback of video and, and of over analysis. It's like, oh, I just need to figure out you know this one angle, or I need to just tweak this a little bit more. I just need to get it perfect. But then at the end of the day, you're like, actually, I just needed to try a little bit harder. Um, so I would say if you try a beta with 100% effort and it it's not working, it's not going, um, and you feel like you've refined it as much as you can, then to to pursue a different beta. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Any other questions? This might be a more practical question, but you know you get a whole boulder problem in the in the frame for video, but what are your tips for using video for roped climbs? Yeah, that that is definitely a much more yeah logistical challenge. Um I I guess depending on how tall the boulder or the route is, if you can do the point five if your phone has the point five view, I find that I'm able to get most of the route um in line or in the video. Um other than like having a friend on the other route, uh, you know, indirect and, and videoing you, I would say that's kind of the best um, solution for now. And, you know, the, the cameras on phones are just getting better and better. So um, if you're able to, to get it all in frame in the 0.5, or if there is a specific uh, part of the climb that you want to get feedback on, then you could, you know, not get the entire video or the entire climb in the video. But yeah. Joy says the struggle is so real with videos for ropes. Yeah, it's it's sometimes hard to tell exactly what's going on. But if you know exactly what's going on, you can still get information from from the video. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Or I guess the other thing would be, yeah, having a friend zoom in on you while you're on the route. Um, but yeah, it's definitely more challenging. Right. And there's perspective differences too. You know, if you're videoing from the ground at a certain right. point, you're just looking at someone's feet and butt. Whereas if you're at least if, like you're, if you're in the gym and there's like a halfway deck that you, that you can get up right. on, you can kind of video from the center of the route. So it's just, a, it's a little more logistically complicated. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Sarah says I've tried to take the crux move and replicate it on a spray wall so I can practice it. Yeah, that's that's a potential good um, other strategy if, is if you can get kind of the 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 spirit of the move <laughs> onto a spray wall or onto a board climb um, and kind of workshop your way through similar moves. It could potentially help uh, when you go back to the the outdoor climb. Yeah, we just need the those dang camera phones to get better. Okay, Arya asks, how do you deal with the movement differences slash, um, I think maybe do, by degrade, do you mean like um, regression? Movement differences, okay. In a move when it's an ISO versus it's at the end of the sequence, how do you cue yourself to do the hard move when you are a bit powered out? Yeah, great question. Um, one thing that I like to do with, um, my clients' videos is I definitely, um, if you have 
a video of you successfully doing the movement ISO, and then you have the video of you um, climbing into it, sometimes the body positioning uh, can be a little bit different. When you're pulling on, maybe you pull on and you're a little bit higher um, in your upper body or your lower body. And um, versus when you're climbing in, it's it's actually a different position. So I would start there and just see if pulling on, um, you're kind of giving yourself a different advantage than you would climbing into it. Um, and then, yeah, uh, trying to do the hard move when you have a little bit less energy. Um, one thing you could potentially do uh, tactically is trying to what I call low point the climb. And I talked about this um, in my stories uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, if any of you saw it, but it's it's just where you're trying to climb into the crux from lower and lower. So slowly adding moves into it. And that might help as well, where you are like, okay, how, how does this look when I'm climbing one move in? Is you know my body positioning different, um, et cetera, et cetera. And kind of, yeah, just trying to figure out exactly what the issue is. Is it that you're tired, physically tired, you're powered down, or is there actually um, a positioning difference? Um, because if it's if it's doing the hard move when you're powered down, I would say that would be to take a little bit more of a um, like physical training approach to it um, versus like a technical approach, if that makes sense. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> we watched your video already, but you'll be able to see it in the replay. <laughs> All right, Jackie asks, have you ever... Or have I ever had a client try a climb and there wasn't really any more beta refinements? It was just a matter of getting stronger or that they weren't prepared to the climb. I used to blame my lack of strength if I couldn't do a move. And only in the past couple of years did I start to focus on refining my beta and technique. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let me take the, yeah, we're doing Q&A now, Wendy. Uh, let me just take this piece by piece. So, okay, have I ever had it? a time where it was a matter of getting stronger or they weren't prepared. It's hard to say because kind of like what I was saying um, in answer to Joy's question, it's like oftentimes we hit a mental wall before we hit that physical wall. Uh, because I, I've experienced it myself too, where I'm like, oh, I can't do this move. I'm just not strong enough. And then if I actually am more patient and I say, okay, I need to try this at least, this move at least five times. By the end of the fifth try, I'm making progress and I'm getting closer. Um, and this is one thing that I really admire about professional climbers. And one of the reasons why professional climbers are so good is because they really have this high threshold for that frustration. And they even if there's a hard move and it doesn't seem like they're close, they're more able to continue to work it until um, they start to make that progress. So if I had a client who was like, oh, I just don't think I'm strong enough for this, I would have them try it for at least a couple of sessions before before trying to blame it on, on strength um, is what I would say. So it's, it's easy to d defer to the physical, uh, thinking that the physical is lacking um, when it's really just needing to work something a little bit longer and, and um, be a little more hard-headed with it. Yeah, totally agree that persistence is key for sure. And yeah, just like, it, it's, it's a lot of times we focus on building that physical capacity and um, a shift I've made in my my own coaching is that we want to really increase the the threshold for the the mental frustration. Okay, how much do you think bicep strength plays in undercling crimps? Um, I mean, it definitely plays a, a a decently large role because of the position of the crimps. You're, it's definitely much more bicep intensive than um, the down pulling holds. Uh, However, underclings are also very body position dependent. Uh, we can, um, uh, the same hold can feel so much better if the hips are higher versus lower. And so sometimes it's, it's yeah, just a matter of finding the right position to be in the undercling. Um, but yes, I would say bicep strength does play a large role in the undercling cramps. Okay, suggestion for folks who feel self-conscious being videoed, asking for a friend. This is definitely really common. Um, yeah, your friend is not alone. It's, it can feel 
I mean, I still even get it sometimes. I, I've started vlogging in the gym recently and even I'm just like, I'm embarrassed, I feel. But at the end of the day, it's it's important to remember that really no one cares. Everyone is so self-conscious about themselves that um, they're rarely paying attention. And it's it's also just like good to remember why you're doing what you're doing, right? You're videoing yourself to improve your climbing. No one can hate on you for that. Um, we're all just trying to become better climbers. So it's 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 definitely a challenge, um, potentially just trying to um do you like graded exposure with it? Oh, this friend is me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the graded exposure, like just try, uh, you know, dipping your toe in, just video yourself once, do a, you know, 15 second clip. That's all you have to do for the day. Um, and you can kind of try and slowly integrate it. But I definitely understand that it's, um, it's a really common, really common thing. Luckily, some gyms are like really normalizing videoing um, yourself. There's a lot of gyms that actually like provide tripods um, these days. Yeah. I mean, at least in um, at bigger gyms that I've been to, there's just like these really nice tripods all around. So it's becoming more normalized and hopefully we keep moving towards that as a community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jackie says video yourself during a solo session, if that's possible. Yeah. And then maybe you can slowly get more comfortable videoing yourself when there's other people around. Joy says, I just try to make sure it's not in the way, like not in the middle of the floor, et cetera. Yeah, it, it can definitely depend on the gym setup too, but oh, wow. Some gyms have installed tripods. Wow. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, some gyms, I guess maybe the gym, newer gyms are set up better for it anyway, or like more spectator friendly or, um, but yeah, you can do it. Any other questions? I love how so many people have their own iPhone tripods now. Yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking of I need to upgrade mine. I've seen some some really nice ones out there. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming, Joy. Uh, thank you for coming, everybody, and for all of your questions and all your participation. I really appreciate it. And I will get the replay out as soon as possible. Um, if you do have any questions, just uh, feel free to reply to the email with the, with the uh, replay link in it. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Aria. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Dan. All right. Hope you all have a good evening. Bye.